Dante Amy Quintel, Nitsiga Sun, Parkland County, Alberta, Otsinia. My name's Amy Quintel. I live in Parkland County, Alberta. I am a Master of Social Work student at the University of Blue Quills in the Indigenous Master of Social Work program. And today I'm coming to you to do an Earth Talk for Earth Day 2023. And I want to spend some time talking about carbon footprints. This is something that I've become recently personally invested in because I really want to reduce my footprint. And I know that I have a responsibility to do this and to take better care of Mother Earth. So essentially, a carbon footprint is the total greenhouse gas emissions caused directly and indirectly by an individual organization event or even a product. And our emissions contribute to climate change. Climate change is one of the most important environmental issues right now. And it's human caused. Human activities like the use of fossil fuels or agriculture, for example. And the changing climate has impacts on the Earth's health and our health. We only have one Mother Earth. And it's really amazing what our behavior as one person can do to make a difference for our planet. But also we have the power to influence others in our behaviors as well. Before we get into what we can do to make changes in our lives, uh, to have impacts on our personal emissions, I want to share a little bit about what I've learned about the state of Canada's emissions and how we compare to the rest of the globe. For those who are unfamiliar, as I know I was until recently, the Paris Agreement is a international treaty on climate change. 196 countries adopted it in 2015, and its goal is to hold the increase of global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. More recently, leaders around the world are stressing the need to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. And that's because the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change indicates that crossing this 1.5 degree threshold risks far more severe climate change impacts, including more frequent and severe droughts, heat waves, and rainfall, which we're already seeing, but more severe. So it has been proven time and time again that human influence has warmed our skies, the waters, and the land. And there have been really widespread and rapid changes at an alarming rate because of what we are cumulatively doing to Mother Earth as humans. It's us that need to make the change. Since the Industrial Revolution, there has been a steady increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, and so much today that the Earth cannot handle it anymore. I'm sure we all recall hearing about during the COVID lockdowns how the Earth was actually, the atmosphere was healing because of human behavior changes. The COVID pandemic lockdowns led to the largest drop in CO2 levels in recorded history. This is evidence that human behavior does have an impact and it's possible to live a low carbon lifestyle. I'm not suggesting extreme lockdowns, but just merely that it's possible to have that great of an impact together as people for the better of our earth. So the UN panel on climate change has said that the number for us to shoot for is 0.7 tons of CO2 per capita each year by 2050. So that means by 2050, we each have to have a footprint of 0.7 tons per year. To be on track with that, uh, our average needs to be 2.5 tons per person per year by 2030. Now to put this in perspective, Right now, Canada's per person or per capita rate of emissions is 15 tons per year. 15 tons. We need to get down to 2.5 tons by 2030. 
I recently calculated my own carbon footprint online and I'm at 10 tons per year. Even though I'm well below the average Canadian, I have a lot of things I can do to reduce to the 2.5 tons. So Canada per capita has among the highest emissions in the world. And in order to prevent runaway warming that is out of control and the extreme weather events that are predicted by the UN's panel, we need to change how we travel, how we heat and cool our homes, the food we eat. We need to change our behaviors. The panel issued a warning in 2021 that without a radical reduction of emissions, the world is dangerously close to a runaway warming, just completely out of control global warming. It's estimated that global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius will be exceeded during the 21st century unless there are huge reductions to CO2 and other gas emissions. The earth has been telling us for a while now that things are not okay. We've seen the changes, we've experienced the different weather events, we've seen other regions experience them too. Arctic ice is melting in the north, we're having more and severe prolonged weather events, such as extreme heat. This is very serious. We have to act and it has to happen quickly. So by 2050, the average Canadian footprint has to be cut by 95%. We need to start this many years ago, but we really need to get moving on it today. So now that we know all of this, I want to talk about five areas we can make a difference in. How we travel, in our food, how we use energy in our homes, the goods and services we buy, and the last thing I wanna to touch on is the power of advocacy. So the David Suzuki Foundation lists four areas we can address right away. The first is how we travel. So about a quarter of Canada's emissions come from our transportation. These are cars and trucks powered by fossil fuels. They're the biggest polluters. We can do better. It just takes some reflection and changes. Over 80% of Canada's population is urban based. This is a huge amount of people who could change their driving habits. We could choose cycling, walking, and public transportation wherever possible, over driving. Even if we could change our habits a little bit, it'll make a difference. If we're driving large, inefficient vehicles, maybe we should think about investing in a hybrid for our next vehicle if we're able to. And finally, don't fly unless you absolutely have to. And David Suzuki Foundation actually suggest purchasing a quality carbon offset if we do have to fly. However, ensuring that you're choosing a program that isn't a business as usual carbon offset project, it's best to support one that wouldn't have happened without the extra funding from the offset sales. If emissions reductions are required by government policy within a particular sector, a project to reduce them shouldn't count as an offset, essentially. So do your research. If you are flying and buying an offset, make sure you're buying one that's actually uh, a good one. So the second area that we can make changes in is with respect to the food we eat. So food is another huge source of emissions. And I never thought about this until recently. And I've already started to change my habits because of understanding it more. And so the food we eat includes not only how the plants and animals are raised and harvested, but how they're processed, packaged, and shipped. So we need to think about that when we're choosing food. So here's a way, a few ways that we can lessen our impact, support local agriculture. So like farmers markets, community agriculture, and wherever possible, choosing organic. Better yet, grow our own food as much as we can and store it and freeze it and whatever you can do to lessen your impact. We can opt for more plant-based meals and less meat and dairy products. I didn't know this, but beef, lamb, and cheese have some of the largest carbon footprints of all food products. 
And so if you're going to stay away from anything, it would be beef, lamb, and cheese. And so this is where traditional sustainable harvesting practices for wild game can be opted for instead. And many of us do this already. Our family harvests and butchers moose, elk, and deer each year. So we're not buying into the emission heavy and unsustainable beef market. And I think, I mean, that's probably why my footprint is 10 tons per year instead of the 15.2. Um, still, my footprint is huge, so there's much more I can do. Nearly half of all food produced worldwide is wasted after production in some manner. And when we throw out food, we're wasting all the resources that went into its production. And so <clears throat> an example of something that I've started to do is we have food loop programs in our community. So like different community organizations will rescue food from the food bank, the local grocery stores, different businesses. And then they put out a call out for people to come pick up the food. So often that's where I've gotten bread, some beautiful vegetables at times. And it's great because you can use it up that day and the food is not going to waste. So food loop programs are really great. The third area that we can make a difference in is how we use the energy in our homes. Canada is the top per person energy consumer in the world. And we really need to take a look at how we use energy. One way to start is looking at our home. And by looking at what we're doing in our home, we're probably going to save money by changing how we do things. I never thought about this before, but our furnaces are like a car that's idling all day. Even if it's not on, it's still running. And so the David Suzuki Foundation suggests switching out a furnace for an electric heat pump if we can. And a heat pump works by taking heat from one location and transferring it to another. It depends on the climate that we're in. Uh, for those to work effectively, though. Getting a home energy audit is great. Uh, there are programs where you can get that done for free. Just to see where your inefficiencies are in your house and the changes that you can make to make um, heat stay in and um, cool air stay in when you need it. If you have air conditioning, try to keep it a couple degrees warmer than you would normally use it. But try other things as well, like not using the stove or oven when it's hot, closing the blinds ahead of time to keep the heat out, and natural creating natural shade around your home. And then in the winter, to prevent heat from escaping. Buildings that are energy efficient do not need a lot of energy to keep them warm. Usually the people in the house and the appliances to keep enough heat and you're not having to run your furnace a lot if it's energy efficient. The fourth area we can make changes in are in the goods and services that we buy. And so this is something I've really started to look at as well, where you think about where products and services come from and what emissions are attached to them. And when we consume less things, we're producing fewer emissions and we're gentler on the earth. So what we can do for the goods and services we buy is to just simply buy less, especially new things. Really think about, do I need this item? Do I really need this item? And what's the story about this item? What emissions are attached to it? Is it better for me to rent, borrow and buy used? wherever I can. Always think of those things. And if you do need to buy something new to think about what quality this item is, how long it's going to last, how efficient is it? Committing to the R's, so that's refuse. So refusing to buy goods in general, but most especially refusing to buy goods with a lot of packaging, reusing things, repairing things, and recycling. And if you are making a purchase that's large, make sure that that is an energy efficient item. 
So in those four areas, you see, we can make a huge impact with very little change. It's just some thoughtfulness that goes into it. But even still, that's not enough. We have a responsibility to our shared Mother Earth to do more. And that takes me to the final point that I want to talk about, which is advocacy. We need to start advocating for Mother Earth. Mother Earth has rights also, and we've forgotten about that. We really have. We can advocate for policies that actually cause individuals to start moving towards living at a net zero footprint. It's possible. People act, they aspire their lives according to what kind of infrastructure is in place and what governments are doing. And so it's important that we advocate to our governments for things that are going to make it easier for people to change their behaviors. The UN's panel on climate change said in their special report on global warming that limiting global temperature increase really, really needs side actions and lifestyle changes. And sometimes these are hampered. Some of the factors that hamper lifestyle changes that can decrease footprints are first, there's limited data. Lots of people like to look at numbers so that they can actually see how much of an impact they're making. That data is needed for policymakers and citizens to make informed choices and to understand what they're doing. Secondly, there is limited evidence that the general public accepts that they need to make drastic changes. And this leads to uncoordinated policies and policies that have little to no impact. Thirdly, policies usually promote changes of individual behavior and they don't address the structural issues or structural drivers. So this leads to policies that are ineffective and citizens who are stuck. They're unable to make changes because they can't. So for example, not having an adequate public transit system, if someone really wants to stop driving, but they're not able to get to where they need to because of the lack of infrastructure, that's an example. And so, as you can see, it's not just the individual that has to change. Policies have to come into place. Businesses, governments need to be on board with products and infrastructure that's sustainable. And we also need to take personal action around the emissions produced by oil extraction. This might seem impossible as one person, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do something about it. Our voices matter and we need to start using them. And the only effective way to ensure emissions are reduced in the oil and gas sector is for government regulation and incentives for them to move away from this energy source in Canada. We need to use our voices and advocacy to talk about these things and show our support for transition to a cleaner economy and cleaner earth. We need to advocate for this so that we're all healthy. The mother earth is healthy. We're all healthy. So taking action on climate change and reducing our emissions, it doesn't mean that we need to change our whole lives around. There are simple things that I talked about that can be done and it's not going to happen overnight, but all of our impacts together will make a difference. If we all start where we can, begin with small changes, there, go- there will be significant reductions. But remember, in order for things like this to happen, it does require government action also. So we need to use our voices, we need to speak up, and it's part of our personal action to reduce our emissions by including that advocacy piece. When we all come together around this issue, our national emissions will be reduced. Thank you all for joining me today for Earth Day 2023. And I hope some of what I have said will stick with you. And maybe even today you can start implementing some of these small changes that will make a huge difference for our Earth.